Professor Feiges is a very, very well-known historian of Russia. He studied at the University of Cambridge and at the State University in, um, in Moscow in 1984, the famous Orwell year 1984. He then taught at Cambridge University for 15 years and then moved on to Birkbeck College in London where he's teaching history now. He's professor of history at Birkbeck College. Um, I think I first came across his name in 2002 when one of his best known books, Natasha's Dance, uh, came out simultaneously in English and in Dutch translation. And it was a big hit because it was sort of the first book that was really written in a post-Soviet context. Historians of Russian history had often looked at Russia as a kind of, well, Russian history leading up to the revolution and the Soviet system. And Professor Feiges took a completely different uh, take. Uh, so there was a lot of, a lot of discussion about uh, this book. He has been publishing many books after that. Many of them have become quite famous. I mentioned The Whisperers, uh, Revolutionary Russia, 1891, eight, uh, 1991, a century, and also um, a few years ago a book on the Crimea before the Crimea started to become a hot issue and a hot potato again. Um, his last book, Revolutionary Russia, 1891-1991, recently appeared in Dutch translation. I have a copy here, and the book is for sale uh, outside this, um, this room. And also, Professor Feiges mentioned that he will be glad to sign copies of his book after his lecture. So when we have finished, you can approach him with a book and have his signature in it. Um, there will be a brief discussion between Dmitry Lebedev, the other guest um, of tonight, who is a research master student at the Faculty of Philosophy here at Radboud University. Um, comes from Yekaterinburg, which is in Russia, just on the other side of the Ural, so formerly in uh, Siberia. Uh, was raised there, has lived there his, all his uh, life, done some work in journalism, so he is quite well versed in Russian reality, Russian actual politics, etc. And he has recently moved to Nijmegen to pursue his studies here. Um, I think that that is what I had to say at this point, so I gladly give the floor to Professor Feiges. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've had a very nice afternoon um, wandering around the, the campus. I'm very, very impressed. Um, in fact, you mentioned over at 1984, Moscow. I mean, it did sort of, much as I loved all the campus buildings and the well-manicured lawns and the well-planned streets and boulevards and the empty emptiness of it all, I was sort of slightly reminded that I felt I was in some sort of socialist realist film because it did, did feel like the, the, what the, the perfect Soviet city would look like if they'd, <laughs> if they'd ever managed to get that far and build one. But, um, <laughs> of course, that brings us to, to, to this evening's topic in a way because it didn't and we're still living in the consequences of the failure of the Soviet system. And um, actually, I've been caught slightly unawares because I thought I was here just to do the normal thing of plugging my book and talking about the Russian Revolution. But it turns out I've got the title Russia as a World Power to talk to, so I will, I will talk about that. But I do um, want to give you some historical background to, to Russia today, and I know Dmitry and Evert are going to join me in a discussion about that. So I will but hopefully uh, look back, but not too far back in history because... Um, uh, I don't want to do that. I want to pitch it to the question of Russia and its position today and obviously the Ukrainian crisis. But I do think it's important to look back historically because actually the people who formulate foreign policy in the West seem to think history started about yesterday. And I would argue that if they read a few history books, mine of course, they would have um, started from a better position uh, with perhaps greater... Uh, sensitivity to the, the Russian angle on this because actually as soon as the Ukrainian revolution took place and it was clear from those leaked messages that the Americans were about regime change that immediately pushed the Russians into a corner from which the aggressive response we've seen from Russia was almost predictable but there's a back history to all of that and I think we need to consider it for what I hope will emerge from this evening, uh, uh, certainly coming from me, um, a, a more historicised view of the situation we are in today vis-à-vis -vis Russia and its position in the world. 
And I say this tentatively because I think uh, in some ways it's been quite difficult. I'm not, not sure how it's panned out in, in the Netherlands, but certainly in Britain and the Anglo-American discussion of the Ukrainian crisis, it's been quite difficult actually to pitch um, a more what I would think of as historically nuanced argument about the whole Russia-Ukrainian conflict or Russian-NATO conflict because they, it's so emotive, because there's such um, an understandably hostile uh, position towards Putin, who's, let's face it, a, a bad guy. And um, there's a very solid defence of Ukrainian sovereignty, which is absolutely right. Um, but at the same time, as soon as one tries to introduce some of these historical nuances and talk about the historical angle as seen from the Russian point of view, one gets shouted down as a sort of Putin stooge or apologist. So um, I'm going to be slightly tentative and, and try and do that at, at the risk of being accused of a Putin stooge. And, but anyone who's read any of my works or journalism or any comment I've ever made on this will know I am not one. But I, but I do insist that it's important to look back historically. And so I am going to try uh, to bridge uh, the gap here and do a little bit of uh, pitching for the, for the book that I mentioned, Revolutionary Russia. Um, because that book does look at the Russian revolutionary tradition over an arc of 100 years from 1891, which is when I started my big first, well, second book as it was, but my first sort of big book on the Russian revolution called The People's Tragedy, which I began in 1891 with a famine crisis of that year, which I believe, still believe, was the beginning of a revolutionary crisis in Russia with the mobilization of the intelligentsia and society generally in the name, in the, in the defense of, of the peasants who were struck by famine in that year against the Tsarist regime, which was widely blamed for causing the famine. And once the famine had spread over an area roughly the size of France, with cholera endemic in that area, um, was negligent in dealing with it. And the whole of society sprang into um, sort of political activism against the regime in the name of the defence of the of starving peasants. And actually, that, that's not just a sort of historical aside here, because one of the issues we're dealing with today, I think, with the strength of Putinism is the weakness of society. And that moment between 1891 and 1917 is probably the, the real window historical window in which Russian soci civil society was properly organised, when there was genuine politics. Arguably the only other period in Russian history when, uh, when, when there was real politics and civil society active politically and possibilities for political change open was clearly the period of 1987 to 1991. So... It's not just that Putin is bad and it's, it's an authoritarian dictatorship. It's that Russian society is weak and we have to understand that weakness. And no doubt, uh, Dmitry uh, uh, and Eva will have things to say about and I hope you will have some things to say about that later on. That book ends in 1991 with the very sudden collapse of communism. Um, and I would dwell just a moment on that too because actually... The suddenness of that revolution, like the suddenness of the revolutions of 1917, is very much in the minds of the Putin regime now. We were discussing over dinner. I would characterise the Putin regime as stable but fragile. It is pretty stable, and the weakness of society has a lot to do with that. But it's, it's also fragile in the sense that the Putin regime is jittery because it knows that at any moment it could collapse. And it... The Ukrainian threat to Russia, not just the revolution of this last year, but the Orange Revolution of 2004, is, 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 and, and the Russian response to it is as much about domestic politics, the fear of a Maidan in Moscow, as it is about Russia's position vis-à-vis -vis NATO and in the world more broadly. So... In other words, we're, we're living in the shadow of a hundred-year arc of revolution with the legacies of the Soviet system, which are very important to understand the situation today. And we need to understand the mindset of Putin, who is a Czechist, who is, in a sense, a Bolshevik, to try to unpack how he looks at the world. And I'm going to talk about some of these legacies in more detail. I'm going to talk in particular about 
the authoritarian legacies of the Soviet system, about the imperial legacies, and about the legacies of the colonists themselves, because this is where today's problem emerges. It was not just a big empire, but with the collapse of that empire in 1991, there were many Russians who were outside the borders of Russia, which is what Putin often talks about. Obviously in East Ukraine and the Crimea, but also in Estonia and Latvia in particular, but Kazakhstan, one might also mention. And from this imperial legacy, you get both, on the one hand, Russian speakers, some of whom, not all, certainly not in, in East Ukraine, all of them, but some Russian speakers who feel bereft of a motherland, who feel they've lost their motherland. Although one often wonders whether they think of their motherland as Russia or the Soviet Union. And I think in some ways they're fighting for some sort of Soviet reconstruction. But on the other hand, you also has, have as a legacy of the collapse of the empire um, a, a sort of mission, an imperial mission, which was accentuated, which was accelerated by the revolution. So, in other words, what I'm suggesting to you is there's quite a long lineage here that we need to think about. Both the imperial legacies of the Tsarist period, an empire reconquered by the Bolsheviks in the early years of Soviet power, but you also have an imperial mission which is injected with revolutionary messianic energy. By which I mean that the revolution infused that imperial vision with the idea that this was an empire without borders. That this was potentially a world empire. The red flag, the, and in particular, you know, the the Red Star, I mean, the five points of the Red Star symbolized the five continents. They were put on top of the Kremlin, well, the final one in 1937, to symbolize the world reach of the revolution. And that, that's not just sort of some casual iconography. That is actually, even under Stalin, who was, you know, clobbering the internationalists and Trotsky uh, and sending them into exile and became something of a Russian nationalist himself. But even under Stalin, that and um, beyond Stalin, you know, in the even as late as the invasion of Afghanistan, I believe that that vision of a world empire whose capital was Moscow, emblem, uh, symbolized by the Red Star, that remained part of Soviet ideology. Not all of it, but I believe it remained part. And that's why my book takes that 100-year arc, because I think it's useful to look at the revolution, not as something that ended in 1921, as so many books do, or 1924, as my book, People's Tragedy, ended with the death of Lenin, or 1932, as Sheila Fitzpatrick's book ends with, you know, the first five-year plan. But to see it as something that was carried on right through until its very sudden collapse in 1991. Let's return, though, to... Uh, no, one footnote to that, because it's something I want to drop now, and then we should probably pick it up later. I think as a result of this imperial legacy and these sort of stranded Russian colonists, you have what we see today, which is a very, very weird situation indeed. Putin argues that it's in Russia's national interest to defend Russian-speaking people outside its borders. What a weird idea. Where does this come from? I mean, this is regardless of whether the Russian speakers in Ukraine want to be defended by Russia. Many of them in East Ukraine want to be Europeans or Ukrainians. But somehow, it's part of this messianic imperial ideology which Putin today proselytizes to argue brazenly flouting all international law or concepts of territorial sovereignty, 
that the Russian speakers in Ukraine are somehow really the subjects of Russia, justifying Russia's aggressive policies in Ukraine. And I'm pretty baffled as to work out where this ideology comes from. But I've got some ideas, uh, and I think I've already suggested one or two of them, and I'm going to return to them a little bit later on, because I think it's got something to do with this imperial messianic ideology, and I think it's got something to do with Russian orthodoxy. And I think we've seen it before in the 19th century, in the build-up to the Crimean War. However, let's uh, try and pursue from 1991 to today something of a chronological course. And let's start with Putin himself. I think the key to understanding Putin is that he's a Czechist. He's a member of the KGB. And his political training came as a young KGB intelligence officer in Dresden. And what he learned from that, essentially, is that Democracy, if left uncontrolled, leads to anarchy. This is actually quite a common Russian view of democracy on the basis of what happened in 1987 to 91 and the 1990s. And indeed, you know, the experience of the Gorbachev years, which are seen very negatively in Russia, were seen by Putin and the KGB as an absolute catastrophe. This was chaos. And the legacy of that for Putin and the Putinites and all of those who, you know, sort of scurried back into power through the reform KGB was that you don't allow uncontrolled democracy. And in fact, uh, the watchword of, of much of Putin's rhetoric and ideology over the years has been this idea of upravljajma demokratia, so of control democracy. I mean, it's a weird paradoxical idea. Manage democracy. So we see this from, right from the beginning with Putin. I think, you know, I mean, the, where are the political parties? It's the Communist Party, reformed from the old Soviet party. And there's, then there's this fake party, United Russia. This isn't a political party. This is, this is a control, this is a managed party, appointed through cronyism. And, and, but it basically controls the parliament. So this is, how, this is a top-down sort of conception of democracy. And the fear of Putin, especially with you know, Ukraine or, or demonstrations in Moscow, is if you let it go out of control, then you, you, you might be swept away. That's the fragility of the, of the system. So it's all about managing and controlling society. And United Russia's part of it. And then I think if you go back to the first elections fought by United Russia, I always remember, Dmitry, you'll no doubt remember it, the, 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 the poster they used. It was like a long white flag with a map of Russia, a very long country. And in it, they had the faces of all the people who had made Russia great. So, Alexander Nevsky, Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, I think, was in there somewhere, uh, Stolypin, Nicholas II, Lenin. Yeah, and there was Stalin. So it's like, uh, this was also an important part of the Putin ideology and the revival of Russia as a world power, that Russia has to get back on its feet after the humiliation of the collapse of the Soviet Union and all its attendant miseries for so many Russian people, the loss of superpower status, hyperinflation, the loss of an economic system that had given them some sort of social security, the loss of an ideology, suddenly being told by unwelcome foreign historians like me that their history was full of black spots. The television screens always full of another story about how bad Stalin was, how bad their history was. Along comes Putin and says, no, let's embrace everything in our history. All those faces on that flag. And that is the beginning, I think, that, that reclamation of Russian and Soviet history. Telling the Russian people they don't have to feel bad about their history. They don't have to beat themselves up over the Stalin terror. Putin said in a famous speech to teachers, 
All right. We don't, let's not dwell on the dark spots. Our history, we had some mistakes, but it's no worse than the United States who dropped the atom bomb. So, from the beginning, that encouragement to the Russians to feel good about themselves as Russian, to take pride in their history, above all, in industrialization, the victory of 1945, and the Soviet space program and the achievements of Soviet science. These are like the, the icons of, of Russian national pride. And boy, did they get sort of bigged up by the Putin regime as part of its nationalist agenda to restore national pride. And it's a sort of mishmash of an ideology. It's nationalist. There were times when it seemed to be moving close towards the rehabilitation of Stalin. Um, it's heavily, in a, in a, you know, in a big hug with the Orthodox Church. Um, it's slightly xenophobic. Um, it has postmodern elements to it, so you have this really weird propagandist Surkov who constantly reinvents himself and the ideology of the system. And then they throw in a little bit of spice of messianism with sort of religious philosophers. It's a mishmash of an ideology. But it, it, in a sense, it, it answered or it spoke to the confusion in which so many people found themselves after all those years of the Soviet system, then the chaos and uh, confusion of the collapse of that system, the humiliation many people felt in the 1990s, the anger they felt at the corruption and all these oligarchs emerging. And Putin was reasserting the power of the state and giving them an ideology which was like Peter the Great's ideology, sort of a bit borrowed from here and a bit borrowed from there. But above all, it was based on nationalism and the reassertion of Russia as a power in the world. Based on the assumption that the collapse of the Soviet Union, as Putin has said many times, was a great catastrophe. Well, some people would say he's trying to reconstruct the Soviet Union now. I wouldn't go as far to say that, but I think he's trying to, he's certainly playing to nostalgia for the Soviet Union, which is pretty widespread in Russia, and he's certainly uh, trying to resurrect elements of the Soviet system. We can discuss that, no doubt, later. However, let's move on, though, because uh, there was a brief period, I believe, between, I would say, two th in the first years of Putin's government, when there, was, there were signs that maybe he was going to be quite a good thing. I mean, I was actually one of the people who thought it's better than what there was before. It's better than what there was in the late years of Yeltsin, when the oligarchs did seem to be taking over Russia. State power was being reasserted against the oligarchs. And in the wake of 9-11, there was a moment when there was cooperation, genuine cooperation between the West and Russia, which was seen as a partner. And Russia got its license in, che in Chechnya as a result. And there was collaboration in intelligence and in foreign policy generally. But I think, uh, and at this time, it did look quite positive. I mean, that, this was a moment, for example, when Putin's vision of Russia as a newly reasserted great power was probably based as much as anybody on the vision of Stolypin. Stolypin was this great last prime minister of Russia who gave this very famous speech in the Duma or the parliament about the need to make Russia a great power, and the key to that was economic liberalisation. And, and at this point of his presidency, Putin seemed to be interested in these ideas of authoritarianism, economic liberalism. The China model, if you like. I mean, maybe, that, you know, that, maybe they began to realise at that point that you know, one of the arguments in my book is that a revolution cannot last more than three generations because the revolutionary energies you need to sustain a revolution were running out by the third generation. The first generation could be, could be uh, called upon to sacrifice for the revolution. 
The second generation could be called upon to sacrifice for the motherland in the Great Patriotic War. But once Khrushchev had blown the lid on the whole of the Stalinist system in 1956 with his secret speech, there was a moral crisis in the system. And actually then the regime tried to sustain itself, I argue, by making economic promises. So the 1961 party programme made this absurd promise that within 20 years the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States economically. Oh, this is the age of Sputnik and so on. But the point is that the, the, the baby boomers, you know, so many people have been wiped out. And so the demographic pattern of the Soviet Union in the late Soviet years was very young. And the baby boomers of the 1950s and the 60s were not interested in the Great Patriotic War or the Great October Socialist Revolution. They wanted what we've got. They wanted material goods. They wanted Western music, fashion and the rest of it. So the economic, the economic promises didn't work and the, and the, and the, um, uh, uh, the, the revolutionary energies are, were, were gradually spent. But in Stalipin, it seemed like, in the ideas of Stalipin, it seemed like economic liberalisation might be the key and a sort of China model could be followed. That might, if Andropov had lived longer, I mean, this, remember the guy after Chinian, after uh, Brezhnev dies, Andropov comes in and he's this KGB reformist, and he's bringing into the into the Politburo people like Gorbachev, who who's been in the agricultural department and has some ideas about market marketization of the agricultural sector. This is the one little opportunity it had in those last days, perhaps, to pursue a China model, keep the one-party state, but try to. Uh, foster economic liberalism. I think this idea, again, was possibly there in the early Putin years. But that opportunity, again, is missed because 2004 is a big turning point, in my view. 2004, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Kremlin gets very jumpy. Is this all being fostered by the United States to try uh, to under undermine the Putin regime, spread revolution and Western influence? That's how they were thinking about it in the Kremlin, I'm sure. And then there was the issue of the Baltic states, the three Baltic states in 2004 joining NATO, from which point the Kremlin has been obsessed with NATO expansionism, which is what Ukraine's all about geopolitically for Russia. Uh, the idea that, that America is encroaching on Soviet z zones of influence and... Uh, this has to be resisted. This imperial legacy that, the, uh, that Russia as the major inheritor state of the Soviet Union should have a sphere of influence in Ukraine as it would then exercise also in Georgia when there was a threat of Georgia joining NATO in the Georgian War of 2008. This is all part of this imperial legacy. But it, the turning point for me was 2004 because we see it not just in terms of Soviet foreign policy, we see it in terms, I think, from about this time in domestic policy. The two are always closely connected. We see from, from about that time the beginnings of a more authoritarian um, uh, 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 trend in Soviet domestic politics. I'm beginning to wrap it on. I was told, how long have I talk, been talking? 25 minutes? 20 minutes? 10? 10, 15? Okay, let me fast forward a bit. I think you got the general drift of my argument so far. I want to come to Crimea and Ukraine. We're fast-forwarding a bit. Crimea uh, is very revealing. Uh, I wrote this book on the Crimean War that I haven't mentioned. At the time I wrote it, it came out in 2010. I mean, Crimea War, nobody really cared about the Crimean War. It seemed very, uh, for academics on the subject to be, to be studying. And then, then the Crimea sort of flared up, and, and I was amused by a tweet I saw. It said, Crimea trending for the first time since 1854. So it suddenly, oh my God, so, so suddenly all these opportunities to write about the Crimea uh, for newspapers and things. And, but actually people aren't really interested in, in, you know, the press these days doesn't seem to be very interested in history either. But I did write a piece and I want to put, put the argument to you now, essentially, because what's really interesting about, about the Crimean War it, and revealing for the discussion of this evening is that 
actually, there are huge numbers of parallels that I see. And I don't want to bore you with all the background of what caused the Crimean War, why Russia got involved, but actually, just the, the sum of it will be obvious. That geopolitically, the Black Sea was very important to Russia, but its major neighbour there was the Ottoman Empire, which everyone knows was declining in power. And they had these Christian minorities, the Slavs of the Balkans in particular, that Russia saw itself responsible to protect. Just like the Russian speakers in Ukraine, the Russians of the 1850s and 1840s thought they had a moral right and a responsibility to protect the orthodox Slavs of the Balkans against Ottoman tyranny. And geopolitically, it was important for Russia to keep Turkey weak as its main neighbour, controlling the straits into the Mediterranean. Russia didn't want to conquer the straits and Constantinople, although that was part of the messianic dreams of some of the more um, extremist Russian nationalists, but they certainly wanted to keep R Turkey weak and divided and under Russian domination, just like Russia's policy today towards Ukraine. And so when an arcane dispute over the privileges of the, Christian, of the Catholic versus Orthodox uh, 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 rites in the Holy Lands in Jerusalem became embroiled in diplomacy... That all sparked the Crimean War, which began with basically Russia sending in its troops in a sort of proxy war, very similar to what we've just seen in East Ukraine, to subdue the Sultan and force him to accept a Russian settlement, what we would call a frozen conflict. But, and here's the difference from today, in 1854, the British and the French felt robust enough to intervene in defence of the Turks and sent an expeditionary force eventually to invade the Crimea. Now, that's a big difference because we're not going to put troops into Ukraine, as we all know. The Crimean conflict is also interesting because actually that war was a really important turning point in Russia's relations with the West. And it, uh, the, the defeat of Russia, we know domestically, obviously, you know, it created um, a crisis, financial crisis, political crisis, and led to a number of reforms within Russia. So there's perhaps a parallel. But it was important also because it created a great deal of resentment in Russia about what we hear from the Kremlin all the time these days about Western double standards. Nicholas I, whose portrait, by the way, hangs in the antechamber to Putin's office in the Kremlin, and who is seen by Russian nationalists today as a hero, because in fighting the Crimean War, he stood up for Russia's interests and their co-religionists in the Balkans against the whole of Europe. And I think is seen as a model of some sort for Putin because he's authoritarian, he has a police regime, and he's a nationalist. Nicholas I, probably you know, out of pride, out of the assertion of Russia's rightful responsibility to protect the co-religionists, which he thought might actually play to Russia's advantage because the, the Slavs of the Balkans would join Russia's invading armies and defeat the Ottomans. Nicholas I was also fed up with what he called Western double standards. So there's this memorandum by one of his main advisors, uh, Pagodin, who was a sort of nationalist pamphleteer, in which 
uh, we see Nicholas's marginalia. And, and Pope Odin's basically arguing, it's okay for the Western powers to occupy Rome as they did, you know, the French occupied Rome in 1849. It's okay for the, for the, for the British to go and send their fleet in defence of some swarthy Jew, as in the Don Pacifico affair. His words, not mine. Um, it's okay for the French to invade Algeria, as they did. But when the Russians want to protect their co-religionists in the Balkans, oh no, it's not allowed. And Nicholas says, too right, absolutely right. And this, I think, actually reinforces his determination to stand up for Russia's interests against all the Western powers. Well, we know its, it's consequences that the Russians were badly defeated, the industrial might of France and Britain with their steamships, their railways, their mini-A rifles was just too much for the old surf economy of Russia. But the defeat was a humiliation for Russia and just, I think, sort of intensified this resentment against the West, a resentment which still plays out today. And the Crimea is, thirdly, I've already given you two reasons why it's a really significant parallel today, but it's also really important for Russia, not just because that war made the Crimea a sort of site of national sacrifice for the, for the Russians, it's also important religiously because Crimea is the seat of Russia's Christian civilization. This was arg supposedly the site where Prince Vladimir received Christianity and was baptized. So, and after that, obviously, it's a very important resort for the aristocracy who build their palaces along the coastline. It's the favourite holiday destination. Chekhov's lady with her lapdog promenades along Yalta's seafront. It's culturally important to them. It's religiously important to them. And it's a very major port. It's the base of their fleet in the Black Sea, which even after... Ukrainian independence meant the Crimea and Peninsula went to, to uh, independent Ukraine, was rented from the Ukrainian government. So for all those reasons, Crimea was almost bound to be a major problem once uh, the Ukrainian revolution pursued as it did right from the beginning an anti-Russian policy. And I think that's right. I mean, obviously there were some mistakes. I mean, passing this law, which was then later um, cancelled to uh, demote the status of the Russian language in Ukraine, big mistake. I would say also, with no doubt we can discuss this big mistake of the uh, Western leaders not to insist that they keep out the far-right elements from the Ukrainian government. All of this just played to um, uh, Kremlin propaganda about the fascist threat, the Western imperialism, all the rest of it. But, and in the Crimea itself, alarmed uh, Russian-speaking people from Crimea. So that was, I think, all bound to happen. And obviously, uh, the referendum at the point of a gun is pretty meaningless, but it, you know, was enough to justify Russia doing, and this is the sort of point I want to move towards in an end on my comments, justified Russia doing what they thought, just as they think that it's in, just as the Russian government seems to think it has a responsibility to protect Russian speakers outside of its borders, so I think what the Crimea proved in this brazen annexation legitimised by some fake referendum, I think that what it shows is that Russia, the Putin regime, thinks, uh, why should... Uh, uh, remember what I said about Nicholas I and double standards? Because all we've heard about Ukraine and Crimea from the Kremlin propaganda machine is about double standards. Uh, the Putin regime thinks, well, why should we abide by Western principles? What are these Western principles? Putin's made many statements and speeches denouncing these Western principles. Where were these Western principles in Kosovo? Uh, 
Where were these Western principles in Iraq and Afghanistan? Why should we play by these rules? So I think what we're seeing is that Russia has sort of disengaged from that international community uh, that was built after 1991 and is beginning to assert its uh, power in its immediate region, but in the broader world too, according to what it sees as its own rules. The defense of Russia's national interests. And it's able to do that because it knows damn well the, weak is, uh, the West is weak. Putin knows that whatever NATO leaders may say, they're not going to arm the Ukrainians properly or put troops on the ground. So it's no good NATO leaders making false promises to the Ukrainians. And so the proxy war of East Ukraine has been a Russian victory. They've got what they wanted. And Ukraine is now in a mess. Because uh, the autonomy that the eastern regions now have been promised has to be delivered by Poroshenko and the Yatsenyuk government or whatever uh, uh, next government comes in. And Russia will dominate the eastern territories and that border will remain essentially open for whatever Russian aid, humanitarian, military, economic, whatever it is, uh, the rebels will need to keep Ukraine destabilised. I believe there were alternatives that could have been pursued. We can perhaps discuss that. But that is the situation now, and those are the new Russian rules. But Putin's able to uh, play by these rules because he knows the West is weak, and he thinks and constantly calls the Western leaders hypocrites. And maybe he's right, because what has happened to our Western principles? How can we denounce... Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine when we invade countries ourselves? Shouldn't we be more certain that a terror state has weapons of mass destruction before we invade it? How are we to uphold, let alone lecture, other powers about our Western principles if we don't stick by them ourselves? Sanctions, they won't be effective. They'll be counterproductive. They will consolidate the Putin regime because it will have a ready excuse for the economic failures that will come partly as a result of the sanctions. There'll be shortages, no doubt. The foreign enemy is to blame. The people who could make a political difference, the rich, the middle classes, won't be affected by the sanctions. They'll have alternative means. I mean, they have freedom to travel. They have bank accounts abroad. They won't be affected. The people who will be affected, the poor, who live in squalid conditions in the provinces and rural areas, have no political clout. So that's not going to change the regime. And why should actually, you know, I mean, if we think about it, if we want to be uh, uh, clear about this, why should uh, the Russian elites, the oligarchs, um, be afraid of sanctions by Britain and America? I mean, I live in London and there's a lot of very rich Russians in London. I mean, London is a financial brothel for Russian oligarchs and elites. Before we start trying to impose effective sanctions or lecture the Russians on Western principles, we should clean up our financial institutions. And that actually, I think that's all we can do. We, we tend to overestimate our influence on Russia. It's a very big country, which, as I've hopefully made clear, is beginning to act by its own rules. So the only influence we can have is by example. Anyway, I will... Stop there, I think. Have I covered my 40 minutes? Um, I did tend to go on, so I think I've said enough. And I'll hand over to Evan. Thank you. It is for a very lively, informative, and I would say brilliant um, lecture. Um, and I can only hope to be 
to be doing something that can add some uh, dimensions to what he has just said. If you look at the picture that is projected in back of me, you see what Mr. Putin sees when he looks out of his office. He looks upon Red Square, and this church is standing on Red Square, and it, as, it, as it were, it symbolizes the image of Russia that many people have, apart from the harsh politics, apart from the imperialism. Uh, Russia is also the country of Orthodox churches, of a weird kind of architecture. Some people think this church is wonderfully beautiful, it's like a fairy tale. Others compare it with Disneyland, um, or the Efteling, to say it in Dutch. Um, but it shows that Russia is also a country that in many respects is very different from what we are used to. And this is one of the topics that I will address. But most of my uh, presentation, the larger part of it, will be questions that I think should be put on the table when we want to talk about Russia and its place in the world. And yeah, So questions about Russia. And I want to address three topics. Russia's ambition. The information, maybe the lack of information, that is, exists around Russia, and the element of mystery. And the church that was just projected uh, stands, in a way, for that mystery. Ambition. Russia has taken the Crimea, Krim in Dutch, virtually without international opposition. There was some verbal protest, but not any real action. And it, that it did so with massive support among Russians. Does this mean that the international community de facto accepts this annexation as part of Russia's legitimate geopolitical interests? Have, has the West, in fact, accepted this situation as being, in a way, not, not on, just, just normal? A second point about ambition. In East Ukraine, it was just discussed a minute ago, Russia has created a situation that bears strong resemblance to the situation in Transnistria, Abkhazia and South South Ossetia, a de facto vassal state of Moscow against which the neighbor, Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, cannot really do much, a fait accompli. Should we see this as a standard tool of the Kremlin's foreign policy? Can we expect more of this? And if we can, the next question is, who's next? The obvious next candidate is Kazakhstan, I think, with its sizable Russian minority in the northwest. A strengthening of the EEC, the Eurasian Economic Community that Putin is setting up, can make this scenario obsolete. But then what about the Baltic states that were already mentioned? Part of the European Union, member of NATO, with Russian minorities ranging between 5 and 30 percent. Will Putin risk a confrontation with the European Union and NATO, a military, a direct confrontation? Where is, in other words, the limit of Russia's ambition, whether it is imperial or defensive or protective? There are many questions. When you read the Dutch newspapers, when you follow news about Russia on television, um, often it seems as if we know what we are talking about, but I think that in the back of that, there is generally a lack of knowledge, a lack of information about Russia. And I want to address that in three questions. Public opinion in the West, including the Netherlands, has it that all Russians support Putin. All Russians are behind Putin's policy. But is this true? Among Russians whom I meet, and admit, admittedly they are mostly academics and students, the opposite seems quite true. They may support to a certain extent his foreign politics, but they remain highly critical of his domestic politics. How well informed are we in fact about what is really going on in Russian society? Its weakness was addressed in Professor Feige's talk. But what do we know about it? What is really going on on the ground in society? And then also, of course, what about Putin's real power bases in that society? Can we use the expressions Russia and the Russians and the Putin regime interchangeably, as we usually do. The Russians will do this, Putin is thinking that, Russia will act in this or that way. Are those expressions synonyms? Public opinion also has it that Russians only hear propaganda. But is this true? I did a check recently, I bought a newspaper, a Russian newspaper, so-called quality newspaper, Kommersant in London, it is published in London and in Russia simultaneously. Uh, I bought the English edition and I was curious about a comparison between the same newspaper as it appears in Russia because in the English version, 
in Russian but published in the United Kingdom, there was quite a balanced commentary on the international situation. There was a large interview with NATO chief Rasmussen uh, in which he expressed his idea that there were Russian troops on the ground in East Ukraine in a Russian newspaper. So I was curious to find out, do Russians read this stuff as well? I happened to have a PhD student who came from Moscow to the Netherlands, so I asked her, can you get me a copy of this same newspaper of the same day from Moscow, the Russian edition, which she brought along and I compared it to, and they were exactly identical, which means that the same balanced kind of information is available in Russia in the form of a quality newspaper that's often compared with the Financial Times, and that's read by middle class and by the economic elite. But the question, of course, is who reads this newspaper? Not all Russians read quality newspapers. But it has to be said that the information is available, and then that raises the issue about propaganda and information. Which leads me to the question, to which extent does the regime manage to brainwash or to indoctrinate the population? Secondly, about information, one often hears that Putin needs an external enemy because his internal power basis is weak. When a high price was recently set on the guy or guys who shot down the MH17, Malaysian Airlines, in East Ukraine, people suspected Russian oligarchs behind this who were putting pressure on Putin. Is the Kremlin's foreign policy today, is it a sign of strength or is it a concealment of weakness? How strong is the Kremlin. These are questions that are not so easy to answer, but of course they are a matter of being informed, being well informed and being um, uh, in the possession of, as Professor Feinges has put it, historicized information, looking at the background of what is actually happening now. But there is another dimension to this, which is the uh, dimension that I would call the dimension, dimension of mystery. Related to the question, an eternal question whether Russia is part of Europe or not, whether we should consider it part of uh, Europe. That's a European question, but it's also a Russian question. European culture is unimaginable without Russia's contributions to art, Kandinsky, Malevich, to literature, Dostoevsky, Nabokov, to poetry, Akhmatova, Brodsky, Nobel Prize winner, several uh, Nobel Prize winners in literature, music, Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich, Film, Eisenstein, one of the founders of modern cinema, Tarkovsky, of course, even science, Mendeleev, Lubachevsky, and philosophy, Bartin, Kozhev. Culturally and intellectually, Russia is obviously part of Europe. Politically, however, it's the big other, and it has always been the big other. It was the big other for uh, Napoleon, it was the big other for um, um, for Hitler, and today it is the big other for Merkel and Obama. How can we understand this situation? Is Russia part of Europe or is it not? In the 1990s, the famous 1990s, a book was published by knowledgeable Finnish scholars entitled Russia, More Different Than Most. All countries are different, but some countries are more different than others. In those same 1990s, Russians, at least the Russians that I spoke with, but Russians on the street, let's say also, were wondering when their country their country of miracles, as they sometimes called it, would finally become normal. And by normal they meant, as was addressed in Professor Feige's speech, more or less like the West, with consumer goods, with freedom to travel, things like that. With um, um, a state that was holding back its, its power. A, the kind of situation that Russians at least imagined that was existing in the West. Is Russia indeed... Should we say that since 2004, or since Putin came to power in 2000, Russia is indeed more different than we have thought for some time, or than Russians have been thinking for some time? Is it mysterious, enigmatic, or are we simply not well informed? That, I think, is an open question. And I hope that these questions will also stimulate you to formulate your own questions for later on. Finally, this question is Russia part of Europe or not, is not, not only our question. It is typically a Russian question. And I know no better way to illustrate this than by citing a famous poem, which every educated Russian knows, a poem by the romantic poet Fyodor Chuchev. And it contains the arguably most frequently quoted lines from Russian poetry ever. But 
then the question will be, is Russia is essentially irrational? Because that is what this poem is about. Does it exceed general or normal standards? Can it not be held accountable as other countries can? Is it a special case? So, no, way, no better way of illustrating this than by this short poem by Fyodor Tchutchev. Umom Rasiu ne panyat, arshinam obshim ne izmerit. U nej asobjena je stać, v Rasiu možna tolke vjerit. In Rusland kan men slechts geloven. In Russia, you can only believe. You cannot understand it, and you should not even, that's the romantic element, of course, you should not even try to understand it. So, so to summarize these questions that I've put in front of you, I think there are at least three general questions. The first was addressed in three points. What is actually the limit of Putin's ambitions? And you could add to, this, to that, is it an offensive ambition or is it a defensive and a self-protective ambition? I think that's an important question for our discussion because it also relates to the, the question, should we somehow fear Russia? Secondly, is the Kremlin's foreign policy, as we see it today, is it a sign of strength or rather a sign of weakness? And third, and this also has to do with geopolitical uh, uh, conditions and, and relations, is Russia part of Europe or is it bound to remain different? I'll stop here. I hope that the questions that I've put on the table um, will, as I said, will stimulate you to... Um, uh, to formulate your own questions. We will address some of these questions in our discussion, but very soon there will be opportunity for you to uh, jump into the discussion and to pose your own questions. And I will, of course, invite uh, Professor Feigis and also, also Dmitry Lebedev to take their place behind this chair. A first question that I want to put to our second guest, Dmitry Lebedev, is do you, as a Russian, as a native Russian, do you recognize this historical perspective on Russia in general terms, this overall picture of Russian history? Does it ring bells? Does it sound familiar? Well, that's kind of the same. I have kind of the same perspective, but with, you know, like certain correction, I would say, uh, because... Uh, if we, if we speak about Putin's policy, like Putin's state, uh, we should definitely acknowledge that uh, it, we shouldn't measure it in like Western terms. In, like institutions, the, which one the Western countries have, like democracy of like church and that, they're not the same in Russia. So, and Putin here is like a measure of a system, so in, in a certain way, so, and if we can talk about like limit of Putin's ambition, so there's definitely limits, of course. So and the fears about whether he's going to take Kazakhstan or like Baltic state, I think they don't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. it's some kind of I don't know what is it. I don't know. I, I can't even imagine where do they come from, because like Ukraine is a particular Putin's problem. Yanukovych was put in alley, now Yanukovych is gone, so what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of answer, like, I don't know, I'm sorry that I'm going too quickly, but it's kind of answer on the second question. It's actually weakness. It's a weakness of a system uh, which is actually alone and try to defend itself by, you know, like spreading this frozen conflict around mm -hmm. the borders and making no use of countries at all, because Crimea, it, uh, annexion of Crimea might be problematic only in one sense, that has Sevastopol, the major harbor, but in other way, they're just gonna put a lot of money uh, in Crimea, just waste that money. So, in that kind of sense, like Putin's uh, mm, system is both rational and irrational. Mm -hmm. It's built up like a gang, and it lifts the laws of a gang. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't even try to consider Putin's system in terms of Western liberal democracies, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's, as you said, it's just, you know, other way around. Uh, yeah. It's even, I would, I would claim it postmodern, because it conceals under all these terms the very, you know, wild essence of it. Uh -huh. Just to return to one of the things that you said, you said this, this, this fear that Putin might, or the Russian army, might invade uh, 
um, uh, the Baltic states and try to set up a, a similar scenario to what was happening in uh, in Ukraine. You ask where does this fear? You might ask where does this fear comes from? Well, it actually comes from the Baltic states. I mean. That's where we hear this fear coming from, and we hear the Baltic states calling for protection by NATO. NATO is actually given, giving that protection. Are you saying that that is simply a nonsensical policy? Definitely, because uh, the very point that Putin has defended Russian speakers, uh, I would totally disagree with that, actually. Uh, because there are a lot of Russian speakers everywhere take... Mm -hmm. Take, I don't know, New York, even Buenos Aires, I don't know. Even Nijmegen. Uh, yeah, even <laughs> Nijmegen, even this room. I would say I've seen a lot of like, yeah. Russian speakers around. Uh, it's a little different point. Putin was never nationalist and would never be nationalist. He just plays a nationalist card, which is quite popular in Russia right now. The, the, the most funny thing about uh, all Ukrainian conflict that uh, uh, during the... Bolotnaya rallies in Moscow two mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, there was a positional movement consisting of liberals, left-wingers, and nationalists all together mixed up uh, protesting against Putin in a poli domestic politics. But after Crimean scenario, after all this nationalistic rhetoric, actually na nationalists started supporting Putin's for policy, uh, which is, of course, c quite ridiculous because... Suddenly, nationalists just, you know, like, starting, uh, you know, detach them from an uh, oppositional movement, starting mm -hmm. supporting Putin. So Putin, totally Putin managed to drive a wedge into the opposition. Definitely. That was only united by their anti-Putin position and not by any positive program. But, uh, Professor Feiges, in your, in your lecture, you also mentioned nationalism. You pointed to the Soviet flag with the five stars representing the five continents of the world. And you well, suggested... That was internationalism, though. That was the Soviet. <laughs> yes, of yeah. course. But yeah. then you suggested that this, this was Russian national imperialism, imperial ambition in <laughs> the internationalist Soviet guise. Um, and yeah, then yeah. you spoke about nationalism as being behind Putin's current imperialism. Uh, imperial or neo-imperial policies. So how do you see this question of Russia's ambition? Where is the limit of this ambition? And to return to one of the questions that I addressed, is it, should we see it as some kind of, you use the word messianic, as some kind of truly imperial program like spreading Russian culture or uh, expanding the space for the Russian people or something like that? Or is it mostly defensive, like we don't want to be encircled, we don't want to be uh, humiliated, we don't want to be put into a, in, into a cage by the West. Well, yeah, perhaps to echo what Dimitri sort of said, anyway, it's, it's neither one nor the other. I would characterise both Soviet foreign policy and Putin's foreign policy as sort of aggressively defensive, if you see what I mean, because going back to the Soviet period, you know, a lot of historians of the Cold War era believed that, you know, that, that international messianic mission of the five stars to conquer the world was, was serious. Mm -hmm. um, that when the opportunity came to invade Poland in a counterattack in 1919, the, the aim was to start a world revolution. I think it was actually a defensive aggression. It was saying to the Versailles powers, back off. Mm -hmm. Um, and showing them the fist. And, and I think that is, 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 is at the heart of, of, of everything we're seeing in this, as well as a more traditional, you know, it's just a great power policy. If you, keep your, if you have a geopolitical interest uh, in, in your region, you keep your neighbours weak and divided. And that's what he's doing with Ukraine, and that's fairly standard foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia's not alone in doing that. No, um, certainly not. So... Um, so, so that's fairly standard. But I, I, I wasn't quite sure. You were saying that you don't see Putin as a nationalist or that he's just an opportunistic use of nationalism to divide the, the opposition. Because I, I think he genuinely is a Russian nationalist. And uh, he might not have started as one because he was probably not in that part of the Communist Party that was particularly nationalist. But I think he certainly adopted Russian nationalism perhaps to begin with as an opportunistic thing. But 
uh, as, as a way of ideologically sort of tapping into something that, that was around and people would, were yearning for to have spoken. Uh, but I think it, it has developed into you know, a, a genuine nationalism in the sense that it's about the assertion of Russia in the world. And I'll go completely in agreement with what you say, that it's, it, it's got its own rules and principles of, of conduct to advance those interests which we shouldn't be trying to measure mm -hmm. by Western standards because it's, it's operating by some other rationale. So if we shouldn't measure it by Western standards, I mean, if you mean the standards of liberal democracy, I can see your, I can see your point. Um, but are there, are there any general standards or aren't there any general standards that we can measure the policy of a country like Russia with? That's to say... Shouldn't we also apply the standards of international law, for example? It was stated by many people that the annexation of the Crimea yeah. was a violation and a massive one of international law. Absolutely. Putin seems to say, well, those rules, they don't apply to me. That's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. And I think it's time to call him on that. I mean, um, you know... Let's take um, some basic international institutions. I mean, there's not much we can do about the United Nations and the Security Council. Russia and China will block most decent policies internationally. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we could kick Russia out of the Council of Europe. I think we should. I've thought so for a long time. Um, you know, the argument against that always was, well, you know, the NGOs in Russia are desperate for that not to happen, because mm -hmm. they think that's the only sort of bit of leverage they have to enforce Russia's behaviour domestically. Yeah. To keep pointing to the Council of Europe. But I mean, <laughs> Russia is in, you know, Russia's in the, in the European court more than any other country. Yeah. It flouts international law, it flouts all our basic principles. Um, there was a time when I thought, well, you know, give it a, give it a probation, give it a, give it a, a warning. I think it's way past that. I think Russia should be kicked out of the Council of Europe. It doesn't abide by European standards. It should get out. But then that goes back to the question uh, about the identification of Russia with, or the Putin regime, with the Russians. Because uh, you mentioned the European Court. The number of cases in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is larger than of any other country. Uh, cases by Russians. And many of them get their cases um, uh, adopted by the European Court of Human Rights, and many of them get their um, recompensation by the Russian government these days. So would kicking Russia out of the Council of Europe out, or out of other um, international organizations, would it not be a way of letting the Russians down, letting the Russian people, well, that many of, them of whom are very critical and oppositional with respect to Putin? Yeah, well, that was always the argument. I just think it, there's a point. You know, when you have a badly behaved pupil who disrupts class, eventually you lose patience and you send him out of the class. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, we, maybe that's not the right policy, but I mean, it's, at what point do you say enough? I don't know, what do you think, Dimitri? I mean, yeah. well, I mean would it help you, you, or hurt? You, you, you said that uh, the sanction, uh, the current sanction, would be totally un counterproductive. So I think kicking out Russia of all this, you know, Mm, European processes like uh, Court of Human Rights would be also counterproductive, especially for uh, like Russian population. Mm -hmm. And it's like you kick out of a class uh, bad <coughs> behaving guy, and he's just you know br breaking all the school no. while you're sitting in class <laughs> or behaving badly is elsewhere. That, is that actually <laughs> you want? You want? Well, I think mm -hmm. no. So maybe that's part of the, yeah, of the dilemma. Say, that, yeah, that it's the dilemma. But the, but the sign of weakness which, which, which the Putin regime sees in, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in the, you know, sort of hypocrisy of the sanctions. Because, you know, there's some sanctions, but, you know, we still let them park their money in London, etc. Um, and the weakness of you know, never actually taking this. I agree, risky. A decision, if it was ever taken, to kick them out of the Council of Europe, which would have negative uh, consequences in some ways, I agree. Nonetheless, you know, it's a sign of weakness to Russia. Um, and I think it's, 
you know, there, there, there's some um, policies of strength we're clearly not prepared to, <coughs> to, 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 to go ahead with and would be with disastrous to go ahead with. The military of, ones. There's a mili any military option would be completely disastrous. And some people are arguing for that. Absolutely crazy. But, but Council of Europe, it's sort of symbolic. Um, it's a sort of, it's a signal. I mean, the other thing that, you know, that could be done that would really hurt them is take the World Cup away from them. Mm -hmm. That would really hurt. <laughs> I mean, that actually might affect Russian opinion more than anything. Yeah, that would be painful. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good, a good point to, to move over to you again, uh, Dmitry. What would really change um, the, the Russian mind or the mind of Putin? What would really have an effect on him? If you look at it as an... It's like changing Putin's head on something other. It's like... Just... Definitely, uh, no one got an answer right now because there's not much hope given to... Uh, Russian opposition at the moment, which is totally dead by now. And so, well, in my opinion, and a lot of like Russian journalists, experts, or whoever thinks so, that it's going to be economy which will finally hurt the whole system badly, but no one ever knows when that's going to happen and how, and how badly, actually. And not as a result of the sanctions, as you were. Maybe sanctions will somehow but contribute but to this. And Professor Fajis was saying the sanctions will not affect the middle class. It will not they will not affect the economic elite. They will affect the poor people, the deprived, who don't have any political clout anyway. Mm. How do you I see that? I don't think so. I mean, like, uh, they put sanctions on the Western good which are actually ex quite expensive so I don't know like if I'm poor and living in the countryside I wouldn't go and buy hamon like every day so it might affect middle class more uh, but also it's not tragic I think mm -hmm. people can live with that yeah yeah so what would really change the situation what kind of a, a massive drop of oil prices is that the only Thing that will make will bring Putin to other yeah. ideas. You say yes. It, yeah, I mean, if you look historically, there's a direct correlation between the price of oil and gas and Russia's assertiveness in the world. When prices are high, Russia's assertive. When prices are low, Russia's weak. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. The only thing that will bring down the Putin regime is a collapse in the oil price. Mm -hmm. Or, you know. Um, diversification of the gas market in Europe in a way that undercuts Gazprom. It's the only thing. Okay. And what about Ukraine? I mean, there's a lot of discussion about Ukraine in the Western press, in a country like the Netherlands, and I'm sure in the United Kingdom as well. I mean, some people will, will see Ukraine as the victim of Russia's foreign policy. Other people will object, saying that, well, yeah, but Ukraine is in itself a failed state. It's a, it's a bunch of corrupt, corrupt oligarchs sitting in, in, in Kiev. So from that perspective, many Ukrainians are perhaps even better off under a Russian regime than under a Ukrainian one. So my question is, to which extent should we, or the West, actually support Ukraine? And at which risk? Mm. You were actually saying we're not going to send any military there? Well, no, no, I mean, that's out of the question. And it's sort of... Mm, it's kind of a complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Because as long as like Ukrainian army is bombing the like residential areas in Donetsk, it might seem weird to any reasonable person to give any word of support to mm -hmm. that regime. But at the same time, uh, like shooting a Malaysian Boeing was also a pretty bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Mildly put. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, it's kind of. It's really difficult for me to say something about Ukraine because the situation got really complicated here. I know some people from Ukraine live in, in this room and they would definitely agree how uh, that situation gets really bad and mm -hmm. there is no consensus inside of Ukraine, so 
No, but, but it is a political question, of course, for Western countries. Like, there is this um, attempt by Lithuania, Poland, and to, to form a military power together with Ukraine, as it were, as a step towards NATO membership of Ukraine. If, eventually, Ukraine becomes a NATO member, there will be yet another border between the NATO and Russia directly, whereas now Ukraine acts as a kind of buffer. So, should other Western countries immediately stop, or not, these attempts by Poland and Lithuania, which I think partly are also attempts to regain some territorial? I don't know if they should, but I'm certainly sure that the Western countries are more you know, busy with the uh, Iraq and Syria issues than Ukraine, I think so. Maybe I'm mistaken. So, and like direct confrontation with, between West and Russia, it's a scenario no one wants. Mm -hmm. So, there might be like some financial support to new Ukrainian government, but mm, I don't know if they should. I think they shouldn't. No, but they are doing it. I, th I think they so, should. So, I mean, I, I agree completely with you that a Western country like the Netherlands or France or the United Kingdom is worried much more about the situation in the Middle East than about the situation in Ukraine. But Poland and Lithuania are bordering on Ukraine and they have different interests. And, I mean, they are part of NATO, so... Yeah, there I, mean, is, I think it's a... Is this a I'm risk? alarmed by the, the, the acceleration of this NATO issue for Ukraine because only six months ago the idea of Ukraine even being considered as a potential member of NATO was, was sort of decried as preposterous. Yes. And suddenly it's, it's, it's being discussed as an imminent possibility and people in the, in the, in the Baltic and Poland are, are, are willing it on. And I think for the West, to, for, for, the, for, for the other NATO powers to allow a slide into this situation of mil effectively by... <laughs> Uh, allowing Ukraine into NATO to militarize the, U which would effectively be to militarize the Ukrainian crisis, would be an absolute catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, it might not be on the horizon of Western leaders to the degree of Syria and Iraq and and, and Islamic State, but it's it's potentially as, um, as 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 big a problem for Europe in the longer term if mm -hmm. if the Ukrainian situation is militarized. So because I think the quickest way to destroy Ukraine is to bring it into NATO, mm -hmm. because that will spark a Russian response, a direct response. But I'm I can imagine sure. some Ukrainians saying, well, that <laughs> not taking Ukraine into NATO is simply a longer way of destroying yeah, Ukraine. On. Ukraine, part of NATO, are NATO re leaders really going to go to war with Russia? No. No. So it's a false promise to make to the Ukrainians. No, I agree completely. Completely false promise, which is a very dangerous thing to do, it completely undermines the credibility of NATO. Yeah, but that means that you are arguing in terms of geopolitical logic, which says if NATO measures Russia not by Western standards, but by the standards of general geopolitical logic, yeah, but goodbye Ukraine. Yeah, but this is how wars begin. I know. They begin... I'm just trying to provoke you. They begin because people forget logic and because... Uh, uh, <laughs> because... Because, yeah. <laughs> because hysterical leaders, from whatever fear they may have that might be rational... Uh, you know, uh, escalate the military option, escalate the rhetoric in a way that the situation becomes polarised much faster than anyone wants or mm -hmm. ever envisaged. And uh, to militarise the Ukrainian crisis would be an absolute disaster mm -hmm. for the whole of Europe, not just Ukraine. No, I agree, but that means giving up Ukraine. No, because it means that actually, and, you know, here I might not have too many friends, but it means that actually... The, 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 the frozen sort of settlement, the conflict as settled by Russia in the way it is now, it's bad. There were alternatives. There were alternative ways of, of handling it from the beginning. But from the position Ukraine is in now, it's better than it could be. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's a destabilized state. Russia will dominate the East. It will never really resolve this in, in the long term. East Ukraine, like Crimea, will be basically a illegitimate state dominated, you know, within a within within a sovereign territory, but dominated by a foreign power. No. But you know, that's better than civil war. So, better than outright civil war. So, so it's, not, it's a bad situation, but it's better than it could be. Mm -hmm.
And frankly, is that better than bringing, militarizing the Ukraine by bringing it into NATO and then allowing the Baltic states to, to, uh, to push the West into war with Russia? Well, that'd be a complete disaster for everybody. So basically you're saying we should see the situation in East Ukraine as part of what you called um, Putin's aggressive defense policies, and we should accept it as such. Well, no, because then suddenly I'm an appeaser, right? But that, <laughs> <laughs> No, but I'm just saying I'm trying to be a realist. Yes. <laughs> and I think we have to be realistic about this. And, and it's no good pretending we're going to put troops on the ground to defend Ukraine against Russian aggression, because we're not. And actually, you know, the, the issue is we should go back a few steps because there were alternatives to this. Mm -hmm. And those alternatives weren't taken. And, we, um, and, and, and the Western yeah, powers, uh, uh, you know, went for a, a settlement in Ukraine, which, the, which was always going to be obvious the Russians weren't going to settle for it. And they were pushed into a corner. They've, uh, they've uh, reacted aggressively. Mm -hmm. And they've imposed a settlement on East Ukraine, which Russians will stick with. It's aggressive defense. Uh, but, but that's bad. It's a cock-up. It's bad. It's bad for Ukraine. You feel sorry for Ukraine now to have to live with this situation. Mm -hmm. But do you then, in order not to appease, say, oh, well, then we'll go to war? No, mm -hmm. you don't. That's not logical. Mm -hmm. So realism is the key And is word, the principle right? big enough? Mm -hmm. No. It's okay, not that's enough. a clear point of view. So realism is the key word here, but how do you act realistically with respect to a power or a country that is, as you said, largely irrational, a postmodern polity that cannot be measured by standards that we apply to other countries, like China maybe? How to act rationally? What is a realist approach of, of, of Russian politics, both Russia domestically and internationally? I mean, of course, like, West shouldn't fear Russia. It's never going to cross the Dnieper River. It's never going to cross the uh, borders of European Union. Uh, it's just a matter of Putin uh, fe feeling good, you know, in his Kremlin apartments. Uh, because uh, as long as, as soon as Yanukovych was kicked out of uh, Kiev, Putin started feeling really uncomfortable mm -hmm. because of that, because it's, uh, it's not a scenario he actually wants to have in front of his residence. Mm -hmm. And also there are like rumors about Putin changing his mind, making, uh, providing more strict policy after he saw the body of dead Gaddafi. So, well, that's kind of legend story or whatever. And he, it's strictly defensive politics, and uh, all this propaganda machine uh, is working only for our, mm, our Russian population. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a bigger problem. Well, but it's definitely the only Russian problem, but it might get worse because the population being brainwashed uh, starting getting more irrational, more irrational than Putin himself. So, mm -hmm. and this big question, what actually Putin is going to do with this population who's got the war in their minds, who really believes in Ukrainian fascist state, which doesn't actually exist, and uh, w yes, what Putin is going to do with them? So the the people who really want to war. So a real danger would be that a large part of the Russian population actually starts to believe the yeah, Kremlin's propaganda. Actually, this is the, the reality created by uh, Russian state TV, but Russian propaganda is uh, worse than mm -hmm. uh, reality of... Uh, How serious is this danger, according to you? Yeah, no, I go along with that, but I think it, um, the, the propaganda... Don't, people, don't, people don't actually have to believe the propaganda. There'll be enough that can be drummed up always to sort of turn out for a demo of support. It's... The prop people live in this world where they just sort of go along with it. I mm -hmm. think that's all the propaganda has to do, create, sort of throw a cloud over the whole thing where, that, where, 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 where policies are acceptable because no one's really questioning them. Mm -hmm. 
so but what if, if what if people more. actually start believing in this this um, Kremlin rhetoric about, about Novo, fascists. Novo Russia, about the fascists mm. in Kiev, things like that? Wow. What if they do not accept when Putin at one point says, yeah. "Okay, I've I've." I've reached yeah. my goals. And well, you know, this is another legacy limit, yeah. of the Soviet era, isn't it? Because all the lies that the mass media put out, all this stuff about foreign enemies and fascists and all the rest of it, 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 it it's not that people necessarily believe it. As I say, it's just that it, 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 it legitimizes a number of things that people don't then question. Mm -hmm. And this is... This is a Soviet thing. It's very much, you know, the, Putin's rhetoric is so much out of the Soviet lexicon at the moment, talking about internal enemies, foreign agents, all this sort of stuff. It's creating a climate of fear in Russia. So it's not that you need active belief. It's that you, it's that what the propaganda system's doing is, is, is sort of sending out signals to the population which reminds them, it's in the collective consciousness, mm -hmm. in the collective memory of, Ooh, you know, the signals are coming out that the country is invaded by foreign agents and spies. Well, that just means people then sort of go back to a default position that they have lived in under the Soviet system. I know it's a big younger population, but these things live in a collective sort of memory bank. Well, I was and I think that's really what's, a, what's, the, what's the sort of sinister and dangerous element at work now. Yeah, totally. I, was, I was going to ask, you mentioned the Soviet, Soviet legacy um, I mean, there is a large Russian population or a large part of the Russian population that does not have conscious memories of the Soviet period. After all, it's 25 years ago. Um, so if you add the first 10 years, yep. everybody under 32, 33 is without direct memory of the Soviet past. Yeah, except what is so alarming is that these Nashi groups and others who have su some sort of nostalgic yearning for for the Soviet Union, most of them are about 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So they've got some fantasy idea of what the Soviet Union was. But this is really the alarming thing. Okay. Last Definitely. question before we go to, uh, to the audience. This weekend there was a demonstration in Moscow, 20,000 people marching against Putin, and their main slogan was, stop lying. Um, a political manifestation in the heart of Moscow, probably on Balotnaya Ploshit, like bo most demonstrations, out of sight from the Kremlin, if you like. Um, is there any serious opposition that's being organized in Russia today? Well, uh, the major Russian political journalist, like Kashin, noted it in, in his last column. Uh, for Putin, it's kind of convenient to have an, this opposition like this, which got his rallies, like, once in, say, six months, and that's it. They see together, they th see that they're not alone. They know that uh, what the state TV is going to say about them, mm -hmm. like, you know, like national traitors, stuff like that. And, but actually, they got no choice. They just walk and they're not leaving uh, Russia for Netherlands, Belgium, France, or whatever. And it's not, a, you know, a dangerous class which is going to, you know, burn re revolutional flame mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now and it can always send the message look we do allow opposition just like we do allow a free press because there is one oppositional newspaper we do maybe allow a radio it's station like things like artificial that. you know space for mm -hmm. all this you know middle class well-educated people <laughs> who are just living there right now but uh, if Putin really wanted to destroy any oppositional activity, he would definitely do that. But mm -hmm. he didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Time for you, time for the audience. Who wants to pose <coughs> a question to one of the... Yes, please. Microphones? There should come a microphone yeah. this way. And there was a second question up there. Mm -hmm. Here, first, first row. Thanks, yeah. Um, uh, you last mentioned uh, the uh, opposition, the, the march of 20,000 in, in, in Moscow. Would you say uh, that opposition is uh, part of the Putin system? They don't want to be, they don't formally are, but they effectively are part of the, the Putin system. Is there a way of, and is there a way of, of effectively uh, opposing them 
without being uh, being part of this this system. Mm -hmm. Well, in some way, yes. I would definitely agree. It's uh, the part of political reality which Putin create totally, uh, you know, lacking some inner logic or some goals and. Well, actually, everyone who's going to the rally, he definitely understands that he's, he ain't going to change the system at all. But it's, you know, it's this, this kind of awkward relationship. You know, they can't live without each other, so... Yeah, but the guy who, would not, who goes to need to watch. have some, some, you know, this kind of illusion of, you know, um, public sphere, public domain, or whatever... But he, the guy who, who goes to that march knows by doing that he's only strengthening Putin in a way. Yeah, he's, he's part of the, the, the formal opposition. So Yeah, definitely. It, it got more formal. It's like the slogans are all the same since 2011, I suppose. So, you know, uh, there were attempts to, you know, to make a political parties out of uh, oppositional different movements, be it left or right or, you know, like national democratic, how they call that. <laughs> it's kind of funny thing. But, you know, in the country where there are no particular elections, they're all falsified, it's totally impossible. And uh, I can see any revolutionary force, like it was in uh, 1970, Gonna you know, kick up, keep putting out of Kremlin now. No, you, you, you got Putsi riots, and they got. It was it was a nice story for yeah. the Guardian or New Yorker. I don't know. It was really good cultural expert, I suppose. Sure. Okay. Um, well, I'd say you know the the important point here really is I think I mean I I agree with what Dimitri has been saying, but I think you know I'd also add that the. What's important is, is not just the sort of authoritarian strength of the Putin regime, but it's the weakness of civil society. It's the weakness of, of, of politics in Russia. Um, you know, 25 years after the collapse of communism, you know, where are the political parties? Where, where are the professional organisations? Where are the consumer societies that represent consumers? Where are the housing associations? You know, where are all those institutions that actually are the bedrock of a democratic society. They're not really there. They're weak. And, and, and that's really the problem. You know, let alone begin to talk about a free press. I mean, you talk about the opposition. You know, where, where, you know, what, you, know you have uh, Nova Gazeta, but I mean, is it really independent? I mean, who really knows? You know, it's like... No, it's true. You know, you're never, you're never quite sure with this licensed opposition with the Lebedevs of this world whether they... Are they really, you know, I mean, is there such a thing even as an ex-KGB officer? I don't know. I mean, it's like, so, the, you know, there's always strings or there's always things that can be used to call somebody in. And so there's all that element of it. But the, but the important point is that, that it's the weakness of civil society, the, the fact that really after 25 years, and that, I mean, that's why I started my talk by sort of talking about the period between 1891 and 1917, because that was really... The only sustained period in which you have political parties being formed, trade unions, mm -hmm. newspapers mm -hmm. active, and political change was the result. And it's not happening now. So that's, you, we have to think about that as much as we have to think about the nastiness, the brutality, and the, and the strength of the Putin regime. Okay, thank you. There was a question in the back of the room. Yeah. Will uh, Putin risk a war against the uh, West if, Ukra if Ukraine gets uh, into the NATO? Because, um, Orlando, you mentioned, um, our, um, all, all crises, uh, uh, well, all, all crises uh, will kill the Russian government. It will, Putin will decline if there was an uh, economic crisis uh, at, uh, for gas or oil. And the West is a big customer of it, of, the, of this goods. Um, and when war, when war starts, economics uh, will die. Um, a lot, it will cost a lot. Can Putin maintain an army? Because 
Yeah, it costs a lot of money to maintain a wall, and and uh, according to Neil Ferguson, a British historian, um, the people are you know, got a bad uh, kind of uh, demographic uh, view. People are dying, a very old uh, society, because of the lack of birth. Um, so I understand the question is whether Putin would risk a war yeah. with the West if Ukraine was part of NATO, given the economic problems. Yeah, and... Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, what's your take on that? Well, I think if, if, um, if, if Ukraine was part of NATO and there were NATO forces in Ukraine... Um, or oh, there were there were there were moves to put NATO forces in Ukraine to defend it against Russia. I think there would be preemptive measures before that by Russia. I think um, the proxy war would become an open war, mm -hmm. and I think um, um, I, I yeah I, I think I don't know I'm, I'm no military expert, but it just seems to me that this is so fundamental to Russia not to have Ukraine in NATO to have that. Okay. Big border and, and the Black Sea cut off from them, and uh, yeah, the potential of missiles and all the rest of it. I just think there would be a prevent a, pre a preemptive measure. I mean, whether that would be an all-out then war between Russia and the West, I don't know. There's all sorts of preventive wars that, or uh, limited conflicts that mm -hmm. could take place rather than that. But I, I certainly think there would be a Russian, a direct Russian. You know, the gloves would come off and there would be a direct Russian response, militarily. Thank you. Also, I would add that uh, I don't think we can consider NATO such an, you know, such an organization with the big tradition of hospitality and stuff. It's a pragmatic military organization, so... And they don't want to give, like, membership to anyone, so it's going to take a long time till mm. Ukraine will finally yeah. end up yeah. in NATO. Okay. There was one question here on the front row. There are many <coughs> questions, and you, I noted you, noted you, you, you. Oh. <laughs> we need As more we microphones. Uh, can, you, can you please be brief? Okay. And can you also be yeah, a bit brief? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture and the very interesting uh, discussion. I would like to pose um, two questions to our guest. Uh, one about the alternatives. In the discussion, you mentioned that there were several alternatives uh, that would have been better at the situation is now in Ukraine. So what exactly could uh, e EU leaders uh, have, mm, yeah, what could they have done better or to prevent the situation as it mm -hmm. now? And then my second question is about the moral crisis. So uh, in your um, uh, lecture, you mentioned uh, that you cannot uh, sustain a revolution for more than uh, three generations and that there's a moral crisis that started already in the Soviet Union. And then um, you said now, okay, you, you see now a weakness of civil society. So what could be um, something that would change the situation if it is... Um, if it is uh, like this now, so what what could actually change it? Do you see any examples from other parts of the world for this? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Alternative wow. options for the EU and what could change? Well, the I, I think. Look, I think the you know as soon as the revolution kicked off, Maidan was you know developed into the revolution, and the snipers happened, and the whole thing collapses. I think uh, basically. And Gorbachev was right when he said that you're basically the EU advisors and the NATO advisors were piling in there much too quickly, giving much too much. Um, they, were, they gave they they well, I mean, they, they gave carte blanche basically to Yatsenyuk, who was their man. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they should have. Um, I think I think you know I think the leaked conversations, um, making it clear um, regime change was the order of the day and F blank blank. K, the EU, I think that was extremely damaging. And I think it was extremely um, ill-advised to allow um, a government to be formed in which there were at least four ministers from the far right, because that just feeds the Kremlin propaganda machine and br brings up all this belief in the fascist regime and all the rest of it. Um, I think that um, from the beginning that there was this crisis... Um, there should have been more uh, time allowed for the agreement um, uh, uh, b between the, you know, the, the, 
the uh, 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 EU and the uh, Ukrainian interim authorities to take root, and there should have been more open channels to Russia to um, involve them in a solution from the beginning. Um, at least there should have been those channels open. And I think all of that might have kept this in a much more uh, a contained way within the political domain. Um, what, are the author what are the alternatives to uh, signs of hope, is what I think you were looking for. Is that, yeah, for, for Russia, I think it's in the... It's got to be in, in, the, in the younger generation that is is going to find some civic courage and going to be more persistent in and find its political voice. Mm -hmm. It's got to be there. Um, I don't see that it can come from anywhere else. I think it means it's Dimitri's generation and younger. Yeah. Um, and, and it will happen. I'm sure it will happen eventually that there will be just younger people more connected to the rest of the world with the internet, more entrepreneurial in spirit, more educated because, you know, they're going to schools in the Netherlands, the UK, USA, they'll go back to <laughs> Russia. They'll, they won't put up with these lies and all of this rubbish they have to put up from, with the, from their leaders and they will eventually, I'm sure eventually, there will be pressures for change. So let's hear the typical representative of the generation that you are sketching. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not so optimistic about it. <laughs> Do you see any, ch any signs, because that was your question, are there any possibilities mm, for no, change? No, I actually see only more like pessimistic perspective because of uh, all this, you know, the whole like discourse uh, is more about to, you know, to make distinction between Russia and Europe. So, like, if, if Russia is not a Europe at all. So that kind of thing, and it's getting bigger and bigger day after day, and actually it threatens any mm, ability to, you know, to make contact, make dialogue uh, between Russia and the West. And as one of the uh, most prominent experts in foreign policy in Russia, Vladislav Inozemtsev, said the scenario of you know orthodox Iran quite bigger than and with nuclear weapon is quite real mm -hmm. and I think so but not for you know for entire century but for five or ten years it might be real no that's a rather pessimistic scenario well <laughs> what can I do <laughs> no, no, <I'm laughs> we want to hear you that's all <coughs> um, there was a question there in the middle of the room, and then I go to you, and then there are at least five more people. Uh, so, my question is, why do you consider the joining uh, of Crimea to our country is uh, fake, and so the referendum is fake? Thank you. The journey of... So yeah, because you, you, and also my question concerns the word annexion. So oh, annexation. Do, yeah, annexation. Why do you use this one word and you say that the referendum is fake? It was a mistake or fake? Sorry, I can't. So you said uh, the referendum was fake. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't, think, it's a, I don't think it's a legitimate mm -hmm. referendum. No, how can you call it a legitimate referendum when it's, you know, sort of put on little scraps of Xerox paper and no proper uh, oversight of it from independent uh, international observers and the Tata population certainly didn't vote and anyone who was going to vote knows probably didn't vote because basically it was militarily occupied by thugs and people who were prepared to uh, intimidate voters into the result they wanted and the question itself was not exactly a, a fair question no, poli no, no, no opportunity was really genuinely given it was either yes to annexation by Russia joining Russia or some very complicated constitutional protocol that not many people could make sense of. So, you know, all of those things, by any international standards, make it a pretty bogus referendum. Yeah, but still, uh, as far as I'm concerned, so uh, the national, uh, international uh, observers, they said that it was quite fair and people were happy because, so it's, 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 it's sort of pretty obvious that there are uh, a huge population of Russian uh, in Crimea. Actually, mo well, most then, people well, are well, Russian, so 
they, then just, they, they, they just vote to go back to Russia. Mm -hmm. It's pretty fair. Yeah, but how do you know? Well, let me ask you then. If the population, and it may well be that if they'd had a squeaky clean referendum recognised by all international observers as legitimate and fair, with the question properly framed, no military intimidation, it might well be that the referendum had given the pro-Russian elements the result they wanted. So why didn't they do that? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you that question. Why didn't they do that? I mean, uh, without... So I think uh, there was no uh, military intimidation. No what? <laughs> no, intimidation. So, no, no, no military no, no, intimidation no military. in Crimea. Ah. <laughs> well... Because... Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, actually, the question is what, what, what was shown in your television and what was shown in other, and what actually people who were there, they told. So, in, so actually, what, uh, what I've done when this everything took place, I watched uh, so like channels like BBC and CNN. I watched Euronews. I watched our channels. I called to some friends in Ukraine. And every information was different, so that's the point. So you consider it because you consider information you've seen where. So you haven't been there. No, no, I haven't been there. And I've watched all those channels too. And I've read all the observers' reports on it. And, and uh, I'm quite prepared to believe that the result would have gone the Russian way mm -hmm. if it had been held fairly. I'm just saying it wasn't a particularly legitimate referendum. It was like a referendum in Russian style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like <laughs> any presidential or parliamentary election <laughs> like this, yeah. Postmodern referendum. <laughs> okay, you kind of vo vote, but you actually don't. <laughs> Next question, please. Um, hi. Assuming that education de-radicalizes and denationalizes, would it be an option to wait for 20 years and see if the next generation is a bit more um, open to Westerners and focus on containment instead, for example? I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, I think the problem is, um, you know, speaking about this from a historical point, about historical consciousness and the legacies of the Soviet system, I think part of the problem is the education system uh, in Russia, that too many of the sort of uh, universities are, are, are and textbooks and curricula and sort of what's allowed to be thought and taught is too, is too caught in the past and there are too many restrictions on freedom of teaching... <laughs> freedom to teach in the class and to write textbooks and use textbooks in schools and universities that are more open. And, and, and so I think we're, we, you know, author, the authoritarian system is being, to some extent, I think, underpinned by, by the education system. But um, yes, I believe that um, an attempt to reform, I mean, you know, Khodorkovsky, Khodorkovsky's been very active in, in, in trying to reform it uh, before he was arrested and... Uh, uh, also since in terms of the scholarships he's been funding there have been various attempts to reform the university system I think that that, that is a way forward uh, but but it's a, it's an up, I think it's an uphill bit of an uphill battle well well I think I can I at this point I would like to add from my own experience I work quite a lot with Russian students um, uh, within the Radboud Honors Academy, for example, there is a think tank. Some of the Dutch students are here tonight. And the Russian students that we work with, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, are very, op very much open to Western uh, things, to Western ideas, and they are as well informed as the Dutch students are. Uh, they are very internationally minded. Uh, but of course, that's university students. Um, but the kind of students that I meet also when I'm in, in, in Russia and I speak with students there, at this point, they are usually very open-minded and very well informed, often better informed about the rest of the world than we are. So it's a question of time, I think, if yeah. the Putin regime manages to put more pressure on the educational system, to put more propaganda into it, uh, and to start at an earlier age with nationalist propaganda, etc., then that might change. But I would say that the present day's generation is really much more Western than, than any representative of the Putin regime, from my experience. 
And that applies also to, to the Russian students that I have in my class here at Nijmegen, like Dmitri, for example. And he's not the only one. Um, so if there is hope, this could perhaps be one of the bottom lines, if there is hope, there is, of course, hope with the new generation only. Um, but that was just um, uh, a remark in between. There were many people who wanted was to... Like, I, I can add about, you know, the hopes, because the younger generation... Well, actually, take me. Uh, it's like 15 years of Putin region, so-called, and this, like, my whole life almost. I don't no. know, like my whole, you know, like. But has it changed your mind? Yes. I mean, like uh, when I started thinking myself, you know, something, make, make conclusion and stuff. I've already seen Putin on the TV screen. So, and the whole generation is kind of shaped by this system. And most hopes were given to the generation which has seen the rise of capitalist society in '90s, mm -hmm. with all this, you know. Art, art boom and music and whatever and actually there were big hopes that this generation is going to change Putin's system but actually it's still not happening. I don't okay. know. We have room for two last questions. One, two. <laughs> you go first. Mm -hmm. You go first and then you in the green shirt. Good evening. I would like to know uh, what your opinion is about the position of the church in general and the influence of the church also in general and, uh, and the influence on Putin. Mm. Difficult to tell. It's very powerful, very wealthy, pretty close to the Kremlin. Um, Putin keeps the church on side. Um, it's a very powerful force and influence. Um, I don't know if I can say much more than that because I'm not really au fait mm -hmm. with the church hierarchs mm -hmm. to know the details of this, but that, that is, I think, the general picture. Dmitry? Well, church is a good companion of Putin's system right now, and it actually resembles the whole system as well. Well, I mean, the main feature of Putinist Russia is the totality of corruption, So, and that applies to the church as well. So... That kind of thing. So, and they share their KGB background also. Yep, <laughs> definitely. Okay, your question. Much for interesting lecture. It, it's it was as interesting as more complicated for my understanding because I'm from Ukraine, and it's quite difficult to come to come up with all this. What what you said here in this auditorium, I've been a bit frightened by. Uh, one phrase which you told that uh, because maybe of our, our corrupted and uh, power, still corrupted power and oligarchs in uh, Kiev, maybe it would be better to be with under the today's Russia. Or if, also, I've been frightened uh, with this statement with the, that there, there were no uh, armies and militaries in Crimea. And uh, the answer for two, uh, all two, these two questions would be definitely no, because not for this we survived two revolutions. But actually, I would like to come back to at the beginning of this lecture and um, ask some comments about historical perspectives and uh, comment about some simultaneously events which we have now in Ukraine. Uh, we so call it war against monuments. Because in uh, I just just for your information, in eastern Ukraine and in southern Ukraine, we have still a lot of uh, remains of Soviet uh, time, especially Lenin's monuments and all these stars and everything what you told about. And uh, simultaneously with all these dramatic events, which we you can watch on the TV, we also have uh, have this like actions f to fall these monuments and just somehow to get rid of this Soviet memory. Which we have, and the question for you is like to comment these events which we have, and also how it's going. Like, is it not also some basement for because there are a lot of these monuments in Russia as well, as some basement of this glory and this concept for Russian power foundation. A fan right. So, not, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I follow the question. Well, it, it, the question is. The question what is about, is, if I understand you correctly, about the present uh, campaigns or attempts in Ukraine to remove, monuments. to remove monuments from the Soviet era. Yeah. Right? Yeah, well... And your comment on that as a historian. 
Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I mean, I can see exactly why Ukrainians would want to remove the monuments because this is uh, a symbolic and but meaningful um, destruction of that Soviet legacy, which is a, as much about um, about freedom as it as it is about ridding Ukraine of 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 a, of a Moscow dominated system, um, and um, so you know, in a sense, it, that that iconoclasm reminds me of. 1848, as much of, as it does remind me of 1917, of a, of a, of a nationalism which is democratic in its um, aspirations because it's about not just national sovereignty, but it's about liberation from totalitarianism. And um, not just the political system of totalitarianism, but the the sort of Soviet speak that is represented by those monuments, the, the sort of monolithic culture mm -hmm. that they represent. Um, uh, and so, yeah, they're, 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 they're a tremendously powerful symbol. And I, and I think, but I think precisely for that reason, the, the Ukrainian revolution, if it's to, you know, to... to, to to emerge victorious from our, from this crisis must keep to that that um, ideal of if you like 1848 um, or February 1917. It must keep to that political ideal and not descend into um, a nationalism which is anti-Russian or allows the removal of monuments to become a xenophobic anti-Russianism that is, which loses sight of those political ideals. Nationalism is, for a country like Ukraine, I believe a very constructive force, when it, as, but only as long as it remains democratic in spirit. Thank you very much. I'm afraid this was the last question and we have to close this, uh, this session. I want to thank <coughs> the two speakers of tonight, Professor Orlando Fargis and Dmitry Lebedev, but also all of you for your questions. I think we have covered a lot of ground. We had Russian participation. We had, fortunately, even Ukrainian participation. So thank you all very much and thank you for a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Ah. <laughs>